stress. It has been emphasized that human rights norms must be rigorously respected by all, including in states of emergency. Coming back to the national level, India has had its fair share of terror attacks and since it seems we as a nation have learned to live with learn to live with it. Serial blasts in local trains in Mumbai and crowded marketplace in Delhi shook the nation. But the emergence of terror in cities like Bangalore and Hyderabad, known as the IT and high tech hubs, has come as an eye opener. The newer generation of terrorists is homegrown, intelligent, well educated and sophisticated. Knowing that India is an emerging global economy, it has been intelligent of them to target the financial centers and centers of economic significance and it is not an act of amateurs. For instance, bombing the local train in Mumbai which, has, which are called as the lifeline of the city and crowded commercial markets, marketplaces in Delhi have shown that the terrorists do their homework well and know where the maximum damage could be incurred. It has been unfortunate for the country like India where the principles of non-violence emerge, emerge to witness emergence of five kinds of terrorism and terrorism not terrorism on five fronts in the last two decades. The most important and strategically significant terrorism is of course the cross-border infiltration, infiltration in Jammu and Kashmir in the Bok occupied Kashmir. Another front where fortunately we have been able to be successful in Punjab was in Punjab in the 1980s but still India is being tried to be crippled on the remaining three fronts which include the problems in the northeast involving insurgency primarily Assam and Manipur states and threat to the national terrorism. One could now see that see and perceive that the terrorism extends over a void canvas encompassing religion, socio-economic, power politics and many such other subject areas. The internal dynamics of external linkages of terrorism have made it a formidable challenge not only to the national security but also to the world peace. It has over the years acquired several dimensions and has become a highly complex phenomenon. There could be fundamental terrorism an explosive combination of fundamentalism free and terrorist violence that is sweeping across several countries. Narco terrorism represents yet another sinister dimension of terrorism. There are documented instances of terrorists and insurgents groupings taking into trafficking into outlaw drugs to finance their operation cyber. Space is another area where the terrorists have sent their presence. Several groups have their own websites through which they launch their propaganda. They also try to cripple the economies of the countries by hacking the accounts and security systems of central banks and illegally transferring money outwards. Then there could be two more types of terrorism, eco-terrorism and developmental terrorism and one should not forget the silent terrorism of illiteracy, poverty and hunger. It's worth mentioning the later forms of terrorism as at the micro level, it's, it is these forms of silent terrorism which have a direct effect on the population and direct link with the infringement of human rights of millions of people. Not only in India, but worldwide, the worst hit being the continent of Africa which once used to be famously called Dark Continent. This, this epithet seems to still exist for there there are territorial conflicts accompanied by the frequent local level famine sitting the sub-Saharan region of the continent. Then we have the lack of literacy and basic uh, civil amenities of living. The suspected perpetrators of attacks also have rights as members of the human family in the course of their apprehension and the prosecution. They have the rights not to be subject to torture or other degrading treatment. The right to be presumed innocent until they are deemed guilty of the crime and the right to be right to public trial. According to Human Rights Watch, many countries who found it to their, found it to their benefit to use terrorism prevention too. 
intensify their own crackdown on political opponents, separatists and religious groups, or to advance unnecessarily restrictive or punitive policies against refugees, asylum seekers, and other foreigners immediately following the 9-11 attacks. Western democracies with long records of an essential respect, of, respect for human rights and institutional checks on excessive states, state power also took advantage of 9-11 to erode checks on state power and undermine human rights. How to curb terrorism and safeguard human rights? There is a need to establish mechanism for strengthening the elaborate strengthening collaborations among governments and competent national authorities and to promote exchange of information particularly on the possible exploitation of modern technology for terrorist purposes. Attention also needs to be paid concluding bilateral and multilateral agreements in combating and preventing terrorist acts with particular emphasis on the issue of extradition. The socio-economic and cultural emancipation of the people at the grassroots level achieved through well-planned developmental economy, by the developmental planning process through democratic norms and principles would remove the local support base of the terrorists and it is proven fact that terrorists cannot function without the local base and also without misguided support from the locals. We have under to understand that every act of terrorism infringes the human rights of the people. We also have to accept that laws restrict rights of the people necessarily or unnecessarily. But we have to be clear that we have no we have to defend terrorism in the context of our country and have to devise temporarily temporary limitations on the rights of the people. International process may land us in situations which may push us to lap on lap of self-appointed inspectors of the world who need our markets and resources and are therefore keen to point out identity of interest in fighting international terrorism. To conclude, in one of the international conferences to discuss on counter-terrorism, the then Secretary General of UN, Kofi Annan said, our responses to terrorism as well as our efforts to thwart, thwart it and prevent it should afford the human rights and terrorists aim to destroy. Respect for human rights, fundamental freedom and the rule of law are essential tools in the efforts to combat terrorism, not privileges to be sacrificed at the time of tension. Having said all these things, because nothing is impossible. See, I as a police officer, for the last 25 years, I can confidently say that if the government, the successive governments of various parts of the world gives better governance, good governance, definitely the impact of the terrorism can be reduced. It's not only that, I always believe that whatever money I possess, whatever affluence I have, Unless and until my neighbor lives in peace, I cannot live in peace. So it is better, you know, it is in the process of developing, in the process of coexistence, it is always better to take along our neighbors so that we can live in peace. In our own interest, we have to live peacefully. To end the to end my what is deliberations. See, nothing is impossible, everything is possible. If you are very dedicated, sincere. See, one small story to advance this. The Westminster Abbey, the famous church in London here, when it was being built. Sir Ren was the supervisor when Carpenter was making something. He went up to him, he stood nearby him for 15-20 minutes, he did not watch him. Losing his patience, after 20 minutes he asked the carpenter, Hi Mr. Carpenter, what are you doing? The carpenter replied that I am building Westminster Abbey. Did not say that I am making a window or whatever. He said I am building Westminster Abbey. With this kind of dedication, if you know that, if you proceed, 
further with a lot of sincerity definitely we can achieve thanks thank you very much for giving me an opportunity to be here thank you once again Respected distinguished guest on the desk, judges, members of parliament, corporate lawyers, bar leaders, diplomats. International law for eradicating human trafficking. Today, the trafficking is a lucrative industry. It has been identified as the fastest growing criminal industry in the world, globally. It is tied with the illegal arms trade as the second largest criminal activity following the drug trade. The total annual revenue for trafficking in persons is estimated to be between 5 billion US dollars and 9 billion the Council of Europe states. People trafficking has reached epidemic proportions over the past decade with the global annual market of about 42.5 billion. The United Nations estimates nearly 2.5 million people from 127 countries are being trafficked around the world. However, it is argued that many of these statistics are grossly inflated to add advocacy of anti-trafficking NGOs and anti-trafficking policies of the government. Due to the definition of trafficking being a process, not singly defined act, and the fact that it is a dynamic proportion with the constantly shifting patterns relating to economic circumstances, much of the statistical evaluation is flawed. Human trafficking differs from people smuggling in the later people voluntarily request on hire an individual known as a smuggler or covertly transport them from one location to another. This generally involves transportation from one country to another where legal entry would be denied upon arrival at the international border. There may be no deception involved in the illegal agreement after the entry into the country and arrival at the ultimate destination. The smuggling person is usually free to find their way over. While smuggling requires travel, trafficking does not. Much of the confusion rests with the term itself. The word trafficking includes the word traffic, which means transportation or travel. However, while the word looks and the sound alike, they do not hold the same meaning. Victims of human trafficking are not permitted to live upon arrival at their destination. They are held against their will through acts of coercion and forced to work or provide services to the traffickers or others. The work to or services may include anything from bounded to forced labor to commercialized sexual exploitation. The arrangement may be structured as a work contract but with no other law low payment or no terms which are highly exploitive. Sometimes the uh, arrangement is structured as a duct bondage with the victims not being permitted to able to pay off the debt. Bounded labor or debt bondage is probably the least known form of labor trafficking today and that it is the most widely used method